Okay, we left off by saying that the two dark blue highlighted text is 35 syllables in the Greek, completing the 560 that Matthew is mapping from Christ's death through 560 years after that, which would be our 590 AD. And the reason why he's doing that is because God has orchestrated time into certain particular segments 490 plus 70 plus 490 equals 1050 and there's a garbled version of this understanding this doctrine that survives in Judaism even to this day but is actually codified incorrectly but still close in the Talmud Sanhedrin 97 through 99 and I did videos on that in my um, how God orchestrates time run those words together lowercase in my God how God orchestrates time Vimeo channel Now a lot of the videos in that channel are similar in YouTube but they're better organized and easier to watch in Vimeo so just go there just search on brain out and then run together the words how God orchestrates time in lowercase and you'll find the channel now what's remarkable about this is that Paul is stopping his text as you can see in the yellow at must not okay the word must isn't in the text in the Greek but it has that meaning so it doesn't matter that it's not specifically that word and that would correspond to 555 AD going by the Matthew timeline that ends at 490 AD which is 560 years after Christ's death. Paul would know that. He would not call it 555 AD but he would know that he's stopping at 30, 35 years before the 560 ends and that's extremely significant because the voting period is 70 years long He's stopping it smack dab in the middle. And time ends if not enough Christians are voting to learn God. And so the question was, well, what's so important about 555 AD that Paul would stop it there? And, you know, first meaning would be, well, obviously it's during the voting period, but it's got to be something relatively specific because that's the way this meter works, especially when it's a satire. And if you look at the Paul Meter GGS 11 videos in Vimeo, some of which are also on YouTube, but the Vimeos are easier, easier to watch. If you look at those videos, and you can just play them in order, you can just look at the channel and you'll see. When you do that, you see that Paul is real specific and satirical against both the Roman Empire and especially against church because he's basically blaming church for being apostate which results in all the horrible vicissitudes that happened to the Roman Empire okay and it, it's extremely precise it's extremely complicated we fortunately have a great deal of writing about that period of time so we can go back and see you know the words that he's using are actually quite important to each year that he's benchmarking he uses one syllable per year and the satire is really pretty biting okay now Greek satire is supposed to be biting and it's supposed to be subtle because and this was true in the Roman Empire especially you never insulted the politi political power uh, directly you were always oblique because you could go to jail for it or you could die Okay, it was a punishable crime, and in Rome, this was this crime was called maestas. That you, if you speak against the majesty of Rome, the emperor would want you to get, um, what do you want to call it, jailed, and possibly put to death. This is probably what happened to John in 88 AD. Somebody wanting to curry favor with some local magistrate, not Domitian. Okay, the mission was too busy persecuting people in the Senate. Somebody wanted to maybe get in on or curry favor with the mission by doing his own manhunt locally, and somebody, you know, nominated John as guilty. Okay, 
So that's more likely what happened. I can't quite prove it yet, but I can prove when it happened. It was 88 to 89 AD when Domitian's own persecution of people in the Senate and even his own family was at its height. And one of the members of his family apparently was accused of converting to Judaism. So that would make it understandable why John, you know, some distance away, you know, in the outskirts of the Roman Empire, why somebody would want to grab him. Because John is a Jew. Okay, it doesn't matter that he believes in Christ, he's a Jew. So that makes a heck of a lot of sense. I can't prove it yet, but there will be something that will come up that will enable us to prove it later on in time. The point is right now is... In verse 17, in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, sort of middle, lower left, whoever is on the housetop must not. That's 555 A.D. Now, why is that? Why does Paul stop there? We already know that he's benchmarking 434, and that's Polkaria. I discussed that in the last increment. But he has to know that this represents 555, converting it to R.A.D., he has to know this represents 35 years before the end of the voting period, yet in the future, after the 490 closes. He's got to know that, because it's real obvious to us that he's doing that, that Matthew's doing that. Now, you know, I haven't yet talked about how Christ himself is metering what he says, but I'm just going with the timeline from verse 1 all the way to what you see highlighted in darker blue. So for Paul to stop, 35 syllables equals years beforehand means that something was really important that happened in 555 A.D. Now, what was it? There were two things. The first thing, the emperor at that time is Justinian the Great. And the second thing is that he was at war with Persia. It kind of started as a domestic dispute because somebody in that was controlling that area of Persia wanted him to adopt uh, Khosrau, K-H-O-S-R-A-U, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, and Justinian didn't want to do that. So that started a sort of domestic dispute which spilled over approximately around 525 into full-scale war, and in 555 that was as far as Justinian went. Beginning in 555 he had a setback where some of the people in Persia um, just they weren't they were rebelling against him they weren't going to accept his authority anymore and the thing that's really funny about that is in 555 um, actually one of his um, surrogates was bringing a bunch of gold as a tribute to those kingdoms so apparently he was paying them money, you know, blackmail, not blackmail, but ransom. He was paying them money not to invade, okay, his territory. And they're basically saying, you know, screw you, we're going we're gonna to rebel anyhow. We don't want your money. So they captured the guy who was bringing the money. And the link to all this will be in the video description so that you can read the story yourself. And if you think what I'm saying is not true, let me know. But from what I'm reading there is they basically said, screw you, and then they took the money anyhow, and then some other Persians decided they wanted to curry favor with Justinian anyway, and in the following year, they managed to, re to collect the money. I guess nobody spent it. And the result was a sort of tr truce in five, 556, 557, the following year. Truce. But Justinian didn't go any farther than that. That's as far as his, as it were, conquering of the territory went. And that's a parallel to what happened to Trajan. Okay? But Trajan, that, that parallel is 117, not 555. And Paul already did a real, you know, that Trajan was the first guy that Paul satirically marked with Telematos, with the, the Eda in Telematos as dying in 117 and then Hadrian takes over and everything that Trajan was trying to accomplish got reversed. Okay, and that's the same theme for each of the other two emperors that Paul plays this Ada game with. But that Trajan took the Roman Empire to its farther extent, farthest extent until the time of Justinian. So, I don't know if he, if Paul is stopping here 
strictly because he wants to make that parallel. Obviously, he's making the parallel to pull carry in 434 because you had better not be in Rome. At, whoops, what happened? You had better not be in Rome at that time. That screensaver went on. So that much we know. But to also block it off here at a 555, meaning, um, has a sort of opposite meaning. It, it's like God saying, hi, Rome isn't, as bad as that is in 434, by 555, Rome isn't going to go any farther, so scripture's going to be safe if you're outside. Now, you know, people reading this are supposed to be aware of the way the meter works. They were supposed to know, okay, I count this syllable. So if you were living, you know, in in the period um, just prior to Polkaria, as you're living there, you're seeing this text that's kind of telling you, okay, next year do this, next year do that. And they're saying, oh, wow, you know what, we better get out of Rome now before we reach to, you know, not, which is the Greek word may in the actual text. Let's just get out now. Okay, but then don't you also I need to know a, a time when you can start to go back. And if you got out, how far should you get out? Well, by 555, the outskirt was Persia. Okay. And so people who would be reading this in 555 would know, okay, he's not going to go. See, this is what's so clever. About it. It's not, he's not going to go farther. Okay. Justinian, because, you know, they're going to be worried about Justinian taking over. Okay, well, Justinian is not, see, clever. Justinian is not going to go farther than that. The word go down in Greek is katabino, but the text actually stops at not. Okay, so, oh, Justinian is not, and they're going to laugh, because by that point, they would know the past 120 years of Polkaria, and they're going to see a second meaning to the word not. Okay, you must not, he will not, ha ha. So scripture, if you're outside the Roman Empire, do you know how far not it's going to go as well as not to be in it? See the cleverness of this? So I think I'm arguing, and I'm not 100% sure, I'm just saying what I seem to see so far, is that Paul is benchmarking the text not only at 434, which is where his text ends in his own timeline once he gets not but he's also aware of where the Lord's timeline is and that's 555 and so he's also benchmarking it there because it's got the opposite meaning that the Roman Empire will not go farther okay the Roman Empire will not go down farther down because you know Persia is north of Israel because you have to presume that a lot of Christians, they just wanted to stay in the same area. But they obviously couldn't stay in Israel proper. It wasn't even legal for them to be there. And so they would not be going there. But they might be going north. They might be going east. They might be going south. And they might be going west. So he's kind of giving them the parameters of how bad the, the Roman Empire is going to get because of its apostasy, because Christians end up... Um, politicizing and getting control in government or the government is taking control over Christianity take your pick both are bad both are Revelation 17 harlot and actually Paul in Ephesians 1 9 had started that doctrine and then uh, John in Revelation 17 picks up on Ephesians 1 9 which uses the word mysterion mystery which is Paul's keyword for church so Revelation um, 17 is fake church, both as a trend of history and as an actual fake church during the time of the tribulation, because all prophecy in the Bible is dual. So that's what I think we're looking at here with Paul. Now, what's left over ends up being really kind of strange. You know, what I told you was this is 560 here, and then in the Lord's own timeline, this is 476, which mirrors Daniel. Um, 914 the cumulative syllable, syllables from Daniel 94 to Daniel 9 Daniel 94 to Daniel 914 with 14 years in abeyance 
saying that you know history is in danger. And then 434 syllables, same as what Paul is going to adopt on purpose, goes through verse 44, verse 32 to verse 44 here. And I, I think the reason why Paul pegs the 44 as ter in terms of his total syllables, which corresponds to Daniel 9, 4 through Daniel 9, 13, both of which are indictments, you know, the, the actual text are indictments of Israel and therefore by parallel indictment of church. I think Paul picks the 434 because it's 62 weeks and because what happens next is verse 45 through 51 are 217 syllables equals years in the Greek. That's the same number as Mary's Magnificat and of course Christ is her son he would know that. And the Magnificat is patterned after Daniel 9.24 through Daniel 9.27. Okay, eliminating 14 syllables because it's possible those 14 won't come to pass. But then God answers Daniel in those very self-same, you know, text with the 62 weeks. So I think there's sort of a double entendre here where the Lord is using 4.34 here and then he essentially halves it to imply that, you know what, those same 231 syllables, you know, 14 plus 217, are still yet to play because he's dying at the beginning of the 62nd week, not at the end. So time isn't going to be the typical 50-year period that it was supposed to be had there been no church. It's going to last a lot longer, and this is his warning about that. That's why I put it in olive. Hopefully it looks like olive in the video. Okay, and it's a summary statement. It's saying, you know, watch out. You don't know when I'm coming. And what makes this particularly interesting is by the time you get to verse 44, the total number of syllables equals years is 1,470. Now, in 30 AD, 1,470, the Lord, of course, dies on Passover 30 AD. And at that point, the moment he dies, is 1,470 years to the day that the initial Passover occurred, that Israel left Egypt. So it's got an Exodus theme, which of course it does. This is the Exodus of time, the Exodus of church, you know, because this is all rapture warning here from 45 to 51, okay? the exodus of time, the exodus of church, and one of the other meanings, the first timeline that he's using, but I have to go back and play with it, starting here in verse 1, because it's 1,470 syllables, by the time you get to verse 44, he's doing a retro retrospective exposition of Israel's history from exodus until his death. That's the same thing that Daniel did, and of course he's playing on Daniel. Daniel made the same kind of structure for his own Daniel 9 prayer. Counting the syllables, which was counting off Israel's kings, starting with Daniel at Heb, uh, David at Hebron. So I think the Lord is doing a whole retrospective exposition from, from Exodus until now. And, and even Daniel's not the first time that kind of thing got done. The first time that that kind of thing got done was by Moses. First, in Genesis 1, he's doing a retrospective exposition back 1050 years to the flood from the day he writes. The flood, he was in the, the beginning of the flood's 1051st year when he writes. He's doing the same thing in a more truncated and, and biting fashion in Psalm 90, which he wrote in the same year. So I think the Lord is playing on both of those passages by doing this. But for purposes of Paul making his parallel, okay, the whole theme of what Paul writes is actually this text. Because Paul's exposition is what are the signs? See, that's why he went backwards. Okay, see? He starts, Paul starts his text parallel on that. He layers it. Why? Because that's basically the title for the text he's using. Okay, it's a satire. You can't see it in English until you know the, the lines, and I mean the meter. 
You know, it's all very syrupy text in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. It's got a, a calendar bite to it. And, and the theme of it is when will these things happen? What will be the signs? And all of what Paul's doing in the meter in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 is what if that rapture happens? What if the rapture happens in this year? And he does it in seven paragraphs to show you the likelihood of the rapture happening. But you can't really predict it. It's just like, well, see, there's a lot of growth in this period, so maybe the rapture will happen now. There's, and then he ends it in the last 91 syllables, which is down here, ending here, with must not. The last 91 syllables have no sub-sevens, meaning that growth is very low. Of course, that makes the rapture more likely because the rapture occurs because Christ, Christians don't grow anymore. See, you know, he's not going to... When there's nobody else believing and there's nobody else growing, that's time, that's when the church goes up. Because if it doesn't, then nobody else is going to believe in Christ. Now what makes that particularly interesting is that Paul crafts his meter in 91s. And this, all the way to here, in the Greek is 91 syllables. So he's beginning with a 91 backdrop. Drop. Then his actual text in Paul starts here and is 56 at this point. So he's basically walling off that as 91, meaning the past. Now, equidistance of the 91s, equidistance of any kind, is a primary feature of Bible meter. They always use equidistance. And this isn't the only equidistance that's being used. Matthew uses it several times in this passage. My question is whether the Lord is deliberately doing it too, and that will have to wait to another increment because I really don't know the answer. But the point I want you to get here is that this is 434 syllables, so Paul is roping in that meaning too, okay? And that makes sense because Paul's whole text is about what, when is the rapture going to happen? And the answer, of course, is nobody knows. Okay, it's going to be just like the days of Noah, and Noah figures very prominently in the meter in both Paul and here in Matthew 24, which you'll see if you look at the I know no me known meter. Okay, especially in this section. So Paul is basically, as it were, tagging this section because it's the same syllable count and saying to the reader, okay. You know, because I'm using 434, you since you memorized by s paragraphs, seven paragraphs, you're going to notice, oh, wait a minute, in Matthew 24, well, they didn't call it Matthew 24, but in that section of Matthew, there was another 434 syllable piece. I mean, the minute I saw this, I knew that he was tying to Daniel's 434 syllable piece. I mean, there aren't going to be too many of them, okay? They have the same doctrinal theme, which we see, you know, explicitly in the text, even, in Daniel 9.26, the 62 weeks, okay? So, you know, I'm sure Paul is also doing that. He's roping that in and saying, this is why I'm metering it at 434. I want you to remember that section when the Lord was talking about the same topic, and I'm sure they did. The pity is, is that our forefathers didn't pass all this down to us. But the Bible is still there, so we can still find it. It's only a matter of counting syllables. So that's where I'll leave it for now. The next um, episode 13, or comment 13, is going to be about more going into detail now about how Paul maps to Matthew. It's really pretty astonishing.